that's been on my heart uh, recently and hopefully encourage you all. So um, Perry encouraged the women at Women's Bible Study to pray for their children over the summer. And that really stuck with me. And I thought, why didn't I think of that already? <laughs> like I pray for my children, but not like really intentionally praying for my children. And so um, over the summer, I have um, committed to meeting with a friend and we are just gonna sit down and pray for our kids because we're not gonna have this once a month time that we can just come together and have un un uninterrupted conversations and fellowship with other moms. And so I actually, got this book. It's called Bible Promises and Prayers for Children. And I'm just going to read a prayer out of the book. And I'm going to use one of my children's name. But if you have a kiddo um, that you want to plug in instead of my kid, you can use your child's name. Um, and I do have three children. And sometimes I just choose one child to pray for at a time. So feel free to do that. So I'm just going to read this prayer. God, you knit identity and value into every cell of Jones's body mind and spirit. Father, I ask you to show me ways to encourage Jones and speak life into who you created this child to be. Show me ways to express how precious Jones is to you and to me. Thank you that you are our source of love. Help me be a better recipient of your tender love so that I can pour out even more of your affection onto those around me, including onto Jones. Holy Spirit, help me slow down and really see this amazing little person in front of me one with a destiny given by God himself. Show me opportunities to nurture, bond, and play with Jones. Lord, modeling for Jones what it means to be an intentional mother. Amen. So um, I'm going to introduce Shannon now. So Shannon Fruge is one of our very own table leader moms, um, and she attends Good Shepherd with her husband and her four children. She has a bachelor's degree in communication studies and a master's degree in counseling from Western Seminary. She had dreams of becoming a television producer, but felt led to leave the media industry to pursue a deeper understanding of the Bible and counseling. She is the founder of Pristine Counseling, her own private practice with the mission of helping people to build their identity on lasting truth. When she is not enjoying time with her kids, she says she likes to have conversations with her husband and is enjoying a season of getting to know other moms in her area more. So welcome, Shannon. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for scaring you with my bathroom disappearance. Okay. If you heard that, I scared them a little with my bathroom disappearance. I always like to go to the bathroom, relax, pray, and look, look over the notes one more time, but I took a little too much liberty with that time, so I'm, they were relieved to see me. So uh, as I said, my name is Shannon Baruge, and it's so fun to see you guys. I look forward to mom to mom every month. It gets me through the long winters here, and um, it's nice to look around and see friends from women's Bible study or um, my own mom to mom table, and it's just fun to be amongst friends. I don't always like to tell people that I'm a counselor because then I feel like they're going to look at me and judge me when my kid's laying on the floor screaming, having a tantrum. So I'm telling you right here, right now, I don't have all this parenting stuff figured out. I'm in this game with you, and I'm here to share what I've learned um, as a counselor, as a trained counselor, what I've seen in the room with my clients that are going through struggles, um, adults and kids alike. And so if you see me at the park and my kid is having a pickle or all four of my kids are in a pickle, I told you right here, I don't have it all figured out. So you can just smile <laughs> and... Um, understand what I'm going through. So what I do as a counselor is called the cognitive behavioral therapy. Put simply, what we think is what we feel is what we do. And so it's an honor to sit with people and talk about what are the lies that they're believing and how are those lies impacting how they feel and their actions and kind of sit down and process um, what is truth and to see those changes um, as a result of their outcome is just such a blessing and so rewarding. So I can't believe this is our last mom to mom. This is our ninth meeting. It's been so fun to prepare this message for you guys. And I do have in the reflection questions, um, some things for you to ponder later. I'm asking that the mentors mom set a three minute timer. So you can just take a moment to pause and pray and just see what the Lord has for you with your relationship with your specific child, how you can be more refreshed in that relationship, what he wants to do with that. And then 
We've had so many amazing speakers. I just wanted us to be able to pause and say, wow, what have I learned this past year? What does God really want me to hone in on for this summer? So I hope that is a refreshing time for you. I would love to pray for us um, as we get started. So dear Heavenly Father, thank you for that there is a place in Boring, Oregon for moms where we can come and be encouraged. We can take off the mask. We can be real with our struggles, Lord. Thank you that we have mentor moms that have been through it. They're physical proof that we can get through this mom season, Lord. Um, I just ask that you be with each woman here. You know she needs refreshment as this mom journey can be long and we can get weary at times, Lord. So I just pray that you would meet her specific need. And during those reflection questions, I just pray that you would really give her hope and encouragement. And I just ask all of this in Jesus' name. So I wanted to start by telling you guys just a little bit of... um, my marriage story. So me and my husband, Z, he now works for the church. We met when we were 14. We were high school sweethearts with a lot of unsweet things to figure out. Um, I accepted Jesus when I was 12. My mom, who's here today, hi mom, um, she had on the Christian channel and someone was giving their testimony about how you could receive Christ. And I had grown up Catholic, which I was grateful to be introduced to the idea of God, but I was never presented with a way of how to actually accept Jesus. I didn't know that I could ask him to be in my life and that he could become the intercessor between me and God. So that was a powerful moment. So I accepted Christ and then I thought, wow, I wanna be um, a television producer because look at what TV does. It goes into people's homes. It sends so many messages. What if I could create content that was Christian that could really impact God and his kingdom? So I set off on that journey and at age 19, My mom helped me drive to Hollywood, California, where I had an internship at Paramount Studios. Um, Did not know what I was doing there either, but God saw me through, and I was able to complete that experience and come home safely. And then from there, I worked at Oregon Public Broadcasting as an intern, and then the following summer, I was hired for a show called Time Team America, and we were traveling around the United States with archeologists trying to uncover mysteries, and the pace of the media production schedule was just really hard to keep up with. And I found that my heart's convictions and my actions slowly became out of whack. I wasn't going to church because I was on the road. I wasn't really talking with friends. I wasn't connected with my family, and I slowly stopped reading God's word. And in that spiritually ill place, I reached out um, to Perry. I don't even know if she remembers, but I just sent an email and I was like, hey, this is what's really going on in my life. I'm a Christian, but this is what's really going on in my life. And I was just met with truth and grace. And then I got plugged into women's Bible study. And there I was with a lot of older women that were married, already had kids, even some of them had grandkids. And I was like, okay, God, really? This is where I'm supposed to be? Just trust that. It's random for a reason. It's so God will put you with people that you wouldn't maybe normally pick, but he has an an intent for that. And so it was there that I got to meet Deborah Anderson, who I asked um, to please come and share. She's been the mentor mom with me for the last two years, and it's been such a joy Um, to work with her, to try to pursue women together and learn from her. So I know you guys are going to enjoy that time of hearing from Deborah. But it was there at that Bible study where um, I was able to be real, what, what was going on in my life. I knew I had to surrender my husband because he wasn't fully surrendered to Jesus yet, even though he was coming to church. And um, Janie Martin just re- told me, she's like, I'm just going to say this to you once, Shannon, but um, you know, you want to work with younger women. Younger women are going to look up to you. This is really going to impact your life if you become married to someone that's not all in for Jesus. And she didn't harbor me any further than that. She just made me ponder and think, you know, we all need those people in our lives that Maybe our parents are telling us that truth, but we just need that other adult to say it in a different way who's not our parent, and that's kind of what she was for me. Um, So fast forward, we have this amazing family that we are grateful for every day. We have such unique kids. Isaiah is our oldest. He's six going on seven. He loves the piano, and he loves, like if I asked him, what do you want to play? He would pick tag. He likes physical sports. And then we have John, who is five, and um, he's 
he said that he prayed for us to have a baby girl. And every morning, I believe him because every morning when he wakes up, he runs to Rose, our daughter, and he just wants to interact with her. Um, he's very imaginative. So if he picked something to play, it would be like drawing something or playing a game he made up. He has this big dry eraser board. He called his calls his iPad and he makes different games and it's just really cool to see. Um, and then Lukey is um, our car guy. He's all about the hot wheels and he likes to carry around a knife to be like dad who has a pocket knife. <laughs> and I try to get him a wooden one, but of course he wants the metal, you know, butter knife. And so we're figuring that out. And then um, Rose, I say she is my dream come true and my biggest fear come true. I did not want to have a girl. Um, I was afraid to have a girl because I was once a girl and I know how passionate they can be. And all I can say about Rose is that she's teaching me how to be a mom of a girl. I have to really pursue her heart first before she complies with me. And this is a whole new territory, but I'm grateful that I'm learning and, and have supportive friends. So why are we here? I think of mom to mom as my pep rally. I wanna win the game of being a good wife, a good mom. Um, and my heart left to itself, it wants what it wants. It wants to be comfortable. It wants to focus on myself. So I love that when I was studying for this, um, this verse, Titus 2, four through eight, it says, these older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. And so that word older, it doesn't just apply to our mentor moms, it applies to us too, as Greg so timely spoke this last Sunday, that ideally we are pulling up other moms behind us as table leader moms, and then we're reaching out to our mentor moms, who again are physical proof that we can get through this challenging season. I love that word train because it means this involves practice. If you've ever tried a new sport or done something new, right? If I tried surfing, I would be like, ah, there's that disequilibrium. Well, that disequilibrium equals growth. And so I'm encouraged that train means I'm not gonna get it right 100% of the time. But like you guys, we know the perfect parent and us working together, we can try to get it right with his help as best as we know how. And sometimes that just involves saying, I'm sorry to our kids, which we have to do often. There's times where I've shown up to women's Bible study where it's time for you to share what's going on. I'm like, I just yelled at my kid um, and I feel horrible. And I, I need that space to confess and have accountability so I can grow in that area. And so often I'm not met with looks of judgment, but I'm met with looks of like, oh yeah, I've been there too. But they want, we're all striving towards Jesus. We want to keep growing. So that's something that I would encourage you guys with in my mentorship journey of being mentored. So often I've been met when I've shared hard things or struggles or things that bug me about my husband. I'm often met with uh, responses like, oh, I've felt that way too, or I know what that's like, or yeah, I struggled with that in that season. And I think the reason that is, is because of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So our struggles are common. So we're so unique at our tables, but once we start sharing, then that's when the commonality comes out. And then that's where that unity of Christ is like, we're not perfect. That's why we're here. And we're looking to him to try to get this as best we can. So next from that place, so ideally we're being trained up. And then from that place, we are training up our kids. So Proverbs 22, six says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And, and that is tricky because you might have done everything as a mom that you knew to do and your kid is still knocking, not walking with the Lord. That's why we keep praying for them, loving them unconditionally and pointing them towards Jesus. Um, with our words and our actions because we don't know when they might return to the Lord. So I just wanna encourage you, if your child has walked away and you did all those things, continue to have that posture of unconditional love. Sometimes you're gonna talk about Jesus. Sometimes you're gonna do what Janie did where you warn and then you say the hard truths and then you just love them in relationship until the Lord prompts you again. Proverbs 22, five says, therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. 
So this is constant training. So this is discipleship. So our kids live with us. They get to see us. Whether we like it or not, they're learning to watch us and emulate our behaviors. Social modeling is the number one teacher. So when you have a baby, you're reading your baby book, it's like, oh, smile at your baby. And then you smile at your baby. And then what does your baby do? Your baby might start to smile. Then it says, oh, stick your tongue out at your baby. And then what does your baby do? Your baby sticks their tongue out. And so what's happening is we have these mirror neurons inside of us that fire in our brain. So when we see someone doing something, um, it's like we're doing it ourselves and it's helping to pre prepare us to emulate that behavior. So today we're going to be talking about God's design for us to play with our kids, how to bond with them. And Deborah's going to share more about that. And then we're also going to talk on healthy brains. So I love this verse. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When I was doing my study for our time together, I really wanted to look up what uh, the word play actually meant. And it says to take delight. So I believe that um, play with our kids, taking delight means it's an invitation to have a posture of the heart, to be in awe of all the good things God has made. And we might naturally do this when we go drive away from the city into the country to look at the stars and just marvel with our kids that, wow, we're here on planet earth and aren't the stars amazing? Or when we go to the, the zoo and we see all the different creatures, the odd creatures, the big creatures, the small creatures, and we just pondered, wow, I wonder why God made the naked mole rat. <laughs> or we might say, um, to our kids something like, do you know who the first person to think of um, fruit snacks was? Well, it was God when he made strawberries and blueberries. I love brainwashing my kids towards good things. <laughs> um, the, according to experts for the Play Partnership of England, they say for children, play is a biological drive and the primary mechanism through which they encounter and explore their immediate physical environment. Children play instinctively with natural elements. They are nat natural experts. There was a really good book that was called um, The Last Child in the Woods. I read several years ago and it was just talking about how nature calms us. If you think of like going to a funeral, sometimes there are no words because the grief is so big, but we offer flowers. There's something about nature that can be so healing. Um, I know my mom would often take us for walks and just be like, well, look at that flower. And did you know the name of that? And it's this training of our kids to notice what is good. There's so much hard in our life and so much hard that they go through. And so teaching them to look for good, um, the science tells us that the more we focus on the positive, the more in gratitude, the more our brains will automatically look for those things. So when you hear the words, mom, will you play with me? What comes to your mind? What does your body feel? Do you feel tense? Like, ah, I cannot give you any of my time. Do you sometimes try to be really quiet like I have to, to see that they not notice me so I can finish that last task? Or are you excited? Are you relaxed? Are you ready to play? Well, it's interesting to note that um, when animals are too sad or too stressed, they don't play with their young. And we can be similar. If we have struggles um, that we're not getting victory over, if we're having extreme challenges in our marriage, um, if a relationship or a situation has consumed us completely to the point where we don't have um, the ability to, to shelf that and have joy elsewhere, it, it might have turned into an idol for our, for our life, right? We need help. And so I wanted to mention that Jen Hibbs is here on staff. She helps women. Um, she'll meet with them briefly to kind of hear what's going on. She's not you know, the full-time counselor person, but she will meet with you. She will hear what's going on. And then her job is to plug you into the right tool and resource. So you might have heard things like, we have Genesis groups, we have the Conquer series, we have Unraveled, we have um, Celebrate Recovery. We have all these amazing resources. So if you're here and you're struggling, I just want you to know there is someone to privately talk to to reach out so you can get support. Now, sometimes we don't always need a counselor. We might need a friend or a mentor. I know one of my mentors, Elizabeth, she would say, having a mentor is like downloading someone else's brain. You just run into these challenges and you only know what your brain tells you to do or what you've learned to do. But when you have a mentor, it's like opening your brain to a whole new world of possibilities. And so my friend Pam wrote a book, A Friend in Me, and she talks about how do you get a mentor? She said, 
First, pray about it. What are you really needing? That's step one. And then number two is look around what women are around you and um, who might have that skill. And then three is to go to that woman and just say, would you um, pray about considering um, meeting with me? There's just a couple of challenges and be honest with them. If you wanna meet once, tell them you wanna meet once. If you wanna meet a couple of times, then tell them that. And then give them the space and time to pray about if that would work with their family and their schedules and their current serving commitments. And if she says yes, great. If she says no, that's okay. That's not your mentor. But just ask for what you need. That's what we're here for. So how can a mom's heart be free to play? A mom's heart can, be, can play when she knows her heart is safe in, with her father. So I'm gonna read you a couple of verses. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then First John, this is my favorite. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. I love that this statement is declarative and saying, and that is what we are. We don't always feel this, but we need to be reminded that this is true. This is who we are. And then First Peter 5, 6 through 7, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. How will she know these truths she so deeply needs? Well, Ideally, she spends time at headquarters where she's reminded of her true worth, her mission, and her value. So her true worth comes from her identity of being his, being a beloved daughter of the king. And her mission is the same mission for men as well. It says in Matthew 28, 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has given, been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples I'm saying this obviously includes our kids if we have them in the home. Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And then there's a promise. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then to know her value, this world that tells us our value comes from our external looks, our beauty, right? And why is it doing that? Because it's selling us lotions and products and endless good things. And of course, it's okay to want to look beautiful. I put on some lipstick today, put in my rollers that I don't normally do. Um, that's a good thing. That's part of God's design. So we can take delight in that. But we know that there's more um, that meets the eye. Proverbs 31, 30 says, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So we wanna know that that's where our value comes from. So mom, will you play with me when you hear these words? What I hope you, what you hear is, um, this is a chance to study your child's heart. So play in nature is designed to help those little babies learn how to um, deal with life, deal with challenges, and the same is happening with us. When we're playing with our kids and we're saying, ouch, that's too hard, we're showing them limits. When we're playing and um, they're not choosing to share and we give them feedback on that, we're training them how to share, right? And all of this leads to how they're gonna relate to their world at large, how they're gonna make friends, how they're gonna have a spouse someday. So this is a chance for us to study our kid's heart to see what they need help with. This is a chance for us to add much needed relational glue. What I mean by that is that if our kids know that we love them by our actions, they're gonna be more um, influenced by us. So if we wanna capture their heart, we need to show them that they matter to us because they will face challenges where they're gonna be conflicted with, okay, I really wanna do this thing, but my mom told me not to, but my, and my mom loves me. We want them to wrestle with that. And this is an invitation to trust that other duties of life can wait. So all the research on multitasking says you, your output is decreased. And so when we can really pause whatever we're doing and, and play with our kids, um, we can give our full heart to that. And then when it's time to go back to that task, we can be more creative. We'll feel better about it because we've given um, our full time to what matters most. And I'm not saying play with your kids 24 seven. We definitely don't do that. Sometimes we need to do um, serve or do things that can't involve them. 
But again, just making sure that when the Holy Spirit prompts us to like, hey, put down that dish, go and play, that we listen. And this ultimately will invite us to, um, to take joy in our, in our children. This is an invitation for joy and to delight in them as God delights in us. So practical application is to pray. What is your need with your child? Maybe there's a specific challenge, something that's been going on. Pray and ask that the Lord would creatively help you um, to, to tackle that challenge. I know for our kids, they start to get pretty angry when we're not spending a lot of time with them. And often some individual attention really helps them to not be as aggressive. And then notice, what type of play do they like? Are they liking uh, imaginative play? Are they wanting more physical play? Um, do they like structured play where you have a craft for them? Just really study them, get to know them. That will really help them to feel seen. And then make space. Um, I was talking to Janie months ago that I was doing this talk and asked her for any tips on bringing joy in the family in the younger years. And she said one time her and another family read in a book um, to have fun with your kids. And so they got out this plastic sheet and they like laid it on the floor and they let the kids have spaghetti, but they use no utensils. And the, imagine how their kids must have thought they had the best parents in the world. So does your house allow for some messes? Is there a table, an old table that can be used for art where if they spill, that's okay? Um, do you have a little garden space or a little apartment where they could pick out their own plants to water or a little garden space where they could put their special rocks and things. All of those things just send a message that there's room for them. And then delay gratification What for ourselves. What's most important to us is what gets tended to. I know we're all busy, we all have things going on, but I know in my own life, I will make time to do certain things. Um, and again, it just feels so much better. We don't wanna have regrets. So when we pause and we play, or we delay that gratification to go play, we're just gonna have that integrity, that good feeling of like, wow, I'm not doing this perfect, but I am tending to what is most important and that feels good. And then again, we get to just take delight and have fun. So it takes time to bond. Before I move on to that, I wanna share real quickly so as a trained counselor, something that I've had the privilege of doing, this is probably the most fun thing that I've got to do um, in, in the counseling room. I'm no longer seeing kid clients. I really, as we've had kids, I've really shrunk my hours and I continue to shrink and not take new people, just trying to meet the needs of family. But something I've loved doing is called TheraPlay. And so I just wanted to briefly describe this so you guys kind of get an idea. So this is prescribed for people, um, children and parents that have been disconnected for any reason. So it could, for this case, it was a daughter who was disconnected from her dad because he had severe depression where he was actually hospitalized. And so what I did with the daughter, she was having a really hard time. The parents were divorced. So during transitions where, hey, it's time to go play with dad, she wasn't wanting to go because she didn't have that attachment because he was gone for some of the vital years of her life where they would have normally played and had attachment time. And so what we did was we set the timer for 30 minutes. And before that, she got to pick all the rules. So during this time, was her dad going to ask her serious questions about her week? Or was he not allowed to talk about anything serious? Was he going to sit on the couch? Or was he going to sit on the floor with her? Um, what play was she going to pick for them to do? And as a therapist, I could um, suggest specific types of play that could help them attach and bond. So when your kids are little, you might put them on your feet and do like the airplane game or put them on your knee and bounce them and just naturally do some of these touch things that make it comfortable to do touch with them. Um, and then for, for her case, she was a little older, so we picked games um, that were called the notice game. So she would change something, maybe take off an earring, pull up a sock while her dad's back was turned. And then she would be like, okay, dad, what do you notice? And so what are we teaching? We're teaching her to get comfortable with her dad, looking at her showing her that he's noticed his changes and different things. We did some face painting so she could have healthy power to kind of draw on dad's face and have fun with that and he could draw on hers. And it was really amazing to see. Um, we just probably did about eight sessions that were geared to look just like this. Um, the only rule was that she couldn't hurt herself or her dad. That is what would stop the play. So there was limits and boundaries. And it was just amazing to see after about eight sessions, she was able to smoothly go with her dad. They were able to 
emulate some of the things we did in the room and he was able to get crafts for her and just kind of make a plan and um, they continued to grow closer in their bond. So it's pretty basic, but it's just a good reminder that it takes time to bond. So you might be thinking, I know I thought this a lot when I first had my son. I was like, man, my life has gotten so slow. Like it takes so long to feed them and hold them and change them and rock them and get them to sleep. And then they wake right back up. But really this is all designed on purpose. It's to keep the mommy close to the baby because so much of that attachment happens in those first three years. And so just somebody told me this, um, I think it was a nurse, but she said, when I was holding my baby, she goes, your job now is to bond. And that just takes time. And I love that that she gave me that mission. So bonding can lead to a secure attachment that lasts a lifetime. It helps obviously our kids to feel secure. So to have that internal security, it helps them for future relationships with forming friendships and potentially a spouse down the road. It helps them to take risks, like trusting people will be there for them if we're there for them. Again, we're not gonna be perfect, we're gonna mess up, but if we're consistently there for them, they're gonna internalize that, that I can trust people and other people can be there for me. It send, we want to send them out relationally full. We want them to feel loved and seen and heard. And all those messages are happening when you're just cleaning their clothes, changing their sheets, feeding them meals, providing them water for the day, giving them vitamins. All of those things are communicating value. We don't want them to go out into the world and be hungry and be willing um, to give up whatever they need to, to have a sense of belonging. That's a really dangerous spot. And I see a lot of clients that unfortunately their families of origin just had a lot of holes and it left them hungry for basic needs. And so they went to go meet those needs in unhealthy ways. And I wanna encourage you guys that uh, bonding and attachment can start today. So if you've been kind of distracted by things, just pray and ask the Lord to help you to slow down and keep your priorities set. And he can, and your kids are gonna feel that shift. This part was fun for me to study. I love learning about the brain. So I wanna read you guys um, a couple of things according to the Welsh Government Services. It says, at birth, your baby has 100 billion brain cells, but few connections between these cells. It is your love, affection, and closeness that help wire up the connections. What does your baby's brain need to develop? Well, your child needs you to help their brain grow well. You don't need to have to do anything complicated or have expensive toys, your baby's developing brain needs love and attention. So when they're really little, right, they cry, we talk to them, we play with them. Um, And then as our children get older and are more verbal, we wanna do what's called training them from the downstairs brain to the upstairs brain. And that simply is, The downstairs brain, they kind of start off and they're like, I want what I want when I want it, right? And we want to train them um, for delayed gratification. The upstairs brain is able to comprehend like consequences. Um, What will happen if I hit my sister with this? Why is that wrong spiritually? So we're trying to build them from their downstairs brain to their upstairs brain. And that's again, God's design and, and us being ahead of them to train them in the way that they should go. I think of that verse that says, today I set before you life or death, choose life that you might live. So our voice is trying to speak that encouragement, choose life, choose good. So then when they're not around us, they're gonna have that internal compass. And then if they accept the Lord, that's what the Holy Spirit is is going to give them as well. So more screen time, more depression. You've probably heard this, but it's just a good reminder. This is not just for our kids, but all the research says it's true of us as well. Screen time in general and social media is causing problems with depression and anxiety. It's creating unhealthy comparison. Um, It's a lot. We have a lot of thoughts throughout the day. And so when we couple that with seeing a ton of other people's thoughts and what they're doing, it can just be overwhelming for us. And so I just really encourage you guys, I'm not saying get rid of all social media. I see some people using it really well um, and posting really positive and encouraging things. But for other people, it's just too much and it can be overwhelming. And so I would just encourage you to seek the Lord on what he would have you to do with that. The Betty Ford Foundation also says screens can be addictive in the same way as drugs or alcohol and lead to isolation, depression, and extreme anxiety. 
I have some clients that they tell me happiness to them is hot chocolate, a blanket, and endless Wi-Fi. And then I have other clients that say, teens, you know, um, that say, man, I'm like in my room all the time and I'm shocked that nobody comes for me. So we want to be parents that come for our kids and say, hey, I miss you. Get out here. Um, so almost every kid I work with, they need help with limits around screen time. You might choose to do games and that sort of thing. Um, in our house, we do a couple games. We try to go a little more old school because things are a little slower um, when you choose old school, which I like. Um, and so we set like external timers. My husband's really good at this. He'll set the timer and say, hey, your 15 minutes is up. Time to switch, one more turn. Okay, now you're done. You know, So we just need things that will help us to get up and get out of that fog of the entertainment. So I really encourage people like maybe set up if you watch YouTube, don't let it just stream to the next show. Make it so that you have to choose. You have to stop and say, do I want to watch that next show? Or what time is it? Because um, again, we need limits as well. I want to share this verse. So what, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So we want our kids to be critical thinkers. There's a lot of studies that say when we're watching TV, where our brain is kind of in a passive state but we want to stay engaged as critical thinkers. And so we might ask ourselves, um, does this show honor the Lord? Um, do the people in these shows, are they emulating things that are beneficial for myself and for my kids? There are some good things out there. We've really enjoyed the how it's made, like how's a bowling ball made or how are crayons made or how are bubbles made or, you know, um, things like that are really fun. And then I've really enjoyed it's put out by the Voice of the Martyrs and it's um, called Torchlighters. And it has amazing stories of um, just saints, people that have died for their faith. Um, Corey Ten Boom and um, Martin Luther. And I've just learned a ton from those, from those shows. They are kind of intense, so screen, screen it first if you have really little ones. And then I've also really enjoyed Pilgrim's Progress. I've never read that book, but that movie is really great. So again, I'm not trying to say, do this, don't do that. You really have to talk with your family and decide what's best for you guys. Some may choose not to have a TV, some may choose to do it, but I'm just uh, encouraging us to use wisdom because it is called programming for a reason. Because remember, social modeling is the number one we learn. So our kids are having um, what's developed is called a, a schema formation. So they're learning what is dating? Um, how do I treat a man? How do I treat a woman? And if we're not kind of educating with them first in that, those things, they're going to just pick it up from what is being modeled. And I really encourage moms, when we read our kids the full Bible, I mean, whoa, it's going to cover every topic. It's going to cover rape. It's going to cover suicide. It's going to cover all of those things. And so there's so many good books that are children's Bibles and different things. And we definitely have used those, but it's been so cool to just read our kids straight scripture and see that they're designed to comprehend it. Um, we asked, we were taught at some camp we went to to ask our kids, what do you think this verse means to really help them to internalize it and apply it and get them to be critically thinking for themselves? So stay engaged at every age and every stage. I don't care if you're 85, we need to see you finish well, mom. So just remember that when they're really little and they're babies, we're, of course, we have to stay engaged because they demand it. But as our kids get older, we can maybe sometimes think, oh, they're, they don't need us as much. And that might be true in some healthy ways, but we need to keep this mindset in every age and every stage. They're still looking to us. They still need guidance. Um, and so we want to provide that for them. So what's your source of joy? There's a new word going around. It's called a dopamine reset. And to put simply, now with science and technology, there's what's called super normal stimuli. So we might think of the Cheeto or the video game, right? And then we have the real stimuli. For this example, we'll use the carrot and um, going on a hike. So when I'm engaging with super normal stimuli, I'm getting that hit of like, Maybe there's natural flavors in this. And I'm getting that intense hit of flavor. Like, oh, this is so good. I want more of it. I'm getting a dopamine release. Or I'm playing my video game or scrolling on my phone. So what makes that so addicting? It's like gambling. It's intermittent rewards. So it's like, am I going to see something good or something bad? I don't know. And it, that's what keeps me engaged. And so 
When I'm engaging with those things, I'm gonna get a sharper dopamine hit, but then it's gonna drop me down and I'm gonna be more seeking to get another dopamine hit. So this leads me, leaves me in a state of continually seeking dopamine, whereas when I'm engaged with the other things, like I never have binge ate carrots before, right? It's just not the way God designed them. And um, when I'm going on a hike, it takes work to get, you know, to the waterfall, but then I'm at the waterfall and I'm enjoying that. And it's, a, it's like a smoother peak of dopamine release and I'm not dropped down. And so it takes more work to get that dopamine hit from holding hands, reading a book, finishing a project, but it's not, um, it doesn't leave me lower than my baseline. So we need to be warned that left to ourselves, we're gonna choose the quick dopamine fixes. Our kids are gonna choose the quick dopamine fixes. In the counseling room, I see so many kids that they don't want to go to basketball practice. They don't want to hang out with their family. They don't want to go to lunch with grandma and grandpa um, because they've been left alone with the devices too long. And that's literally changed their brain. And I want to tell you a quick story. The Lord, I believe he had this happen for you guys to hear this story. So like I said, we do do some old school games for our kids and we limit it. And they were acting up. They're like, mom, like we want our game. And I like took it away as a consequence. And I literally put it in my husband's car because if they knew it was in the house, they were gonna try to find it. So he drove away with the game. And I just said, um, you know, we're not doing it. And you guys did this. And because you did this, you know, we're not having that. And they were crying and bawling. And you could tell they were putting too much joy into this game. And so after a while of crying and screaming, we went outside and we were playing and they just got covered in mud and they were rolling around in mud and um, in the water and just having a blast. And my five-year-old yells out, mom, thanks for taking away my game. And I, oh, this is just from the Lord to share. So he knew he would not have picked that, but he saw in that moment, wow, I would have never picked this, but this is so much better better than my game. So we often talk about this, like, hey, I know that was hard, but didn't this feel good? So in conclusion, I just wanna say we need real to heal. So we need real relationships with each other. Our kids need us. We need real truth. Jesus is the truth. As our world gets darker, it feels more crazy, right? We need not panic, but turn to the truth. And the truth is gonna shine even brighter with all these lies. We need real self-sacrifice so they know we really love them. And I just want to end with this really fast. Um, I was reading Linda Weber's book, The Eternal Mark of a Mom. And man, she's very straight to the point. Um, I love it. And she had a rough upbringing and that made me respect this even more. So I'm just going to end with this. It says, mom, if you don't do it, who will? If this isn't all important next to nurturing of your marriage, what is? The challenge is yours. Will your family enjoy the positive results of your efforts? I need my short-sighted vision of motherhood corrected with an eternal perspective, writes Gloria Furman, mama of four and author of Missional Mother. Otherwise, I will, keep, I will not keep my gaze fixed on the horizon of eternity. If you haven't done it before, won't you commit yourself right now to making the main thing the main thing? What better legacy could you leave to your children than your full investment in their growing up years? If you're already... If you've already made that nurturing commitment, take pride in your deci decision, affirm it. Motherhood is the greatest cause you could follow and you've given yourself to it. Now do all you can to live out that decision with excellence. Thank you. Okay, well, it's so fun to be back here. I really wanted you guys to get to enjoy Deborah as I have, so it's just been so fun. Um, being with Deborah, we wanted to just sit and have a table here because this would be like our normal setting. Um, but we're in different stages of life, but have struggles all the same. And so it's just been really nice to get to know you and have you be real with me about some of your challenges. I think it helps me not to feel like I'm always coming to you with things, but like you're in it too. So. Yes, um, I so appreciate uh, Shannon. I, sometimes I feel like she's mentoring me. Who's mentoring each other here? <laughs> but we do. We speak truth into each other's life, her prayers. And um, just so important to be authentic with each other. And just sometimes we just have to take things to the Lord. And um, it's just great to have that person uh, praying for, we're praying for each other. Yes. 
Okay, so this was really fun. I didn't know this when I first met Deborah, but she also has three boys and one girl just like me. So Deborah, what did you do to intentionally bond with your son? Okay, yes, I have uh, three sons and a daughter. They're all uh, two years apart, and um, just grateful for that time. Uh, first, I want you to know that I'm really grateful that um, I had some really good teaching early on in my walk uh, with the Lord, and a verse that um, the Lord gave me early on was, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his, and his people, and the sheep of his pasture. And, you know, I was thinking about that when I would get pregnant. You know, God is making this child in my womb, but it's his. Mm. It's not mine. He's making it. But I have the privilege of being part of his redemptive story. And the Lord just encouraged me, you pursue your children just as I have pursued you. He started pursuing me at a very young age. And um, so that just really encouraged me. But um, time is precious and very essential. Um, I loved reading books with my boys um, because they were very active. So it gave me a time to um, kind of quiet us down before nap time, before bedtime. And, um, you know, it was a learning time. We could read, you know, educational books, uh, fun books, humorous books, um, books that um, just encouraged uh, faith in God. And uh, so that was very important. And then um, having active boys, it didn't take me too long, especially when they're, you know, standing on my kitchen counters and mm-hmm, looking mm-hmm. in the cupboards. It's like, okay, these guys are about exploration and discovery. Mm. So that means that I needed to really get outside. That was a healthier place for all of us to be outside and letting them explore and discover. And what did that look like? You know, it's just like um, the little house that we rented for eight years. There was uh, blackberry bushes along the fence line, and they could go out there and pick blackberries. And they, you know, I could take them to, we lived right next to a school. So when the kids were out of school and, you know, they're two and four, we could go over to the schoolyard and just run and play and do whatever. So um, that was uh, really important. Um, So outdoor time was really essential for them. You know, as they got older, just special outings. I mean, really, in our backyard, we had a huge sandbox. And... I love boys because they want to, me to see what, you know, they built this fort outside. And they would invite me to come and look at it and play with them. They really did better when I was there with them. And for many years, yes, I was on the floor. I was part of Legos and Duplos and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, it was kind of simple and it just flowed really nice and... Um, I came to understand when my boys wanted me to play with them, what they were saying is, would you be my friend? I want, mm-hmm. I want you to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. And um, I, yeah, I valued that. And um, I wanted to be their friend then, and I wanted to be their friend in adulthood too. So um, that was important. Yes. And what about with your daughter, Shanna? Okay. That we see serving around church. Yes. Well, she, um, you know, is kind of icing on the cake and a real joy for my husband and I to have a girl. And she joined the Calvary at a really young age because uh, when you have three older brothers, or even one older brother, if you want to play with them, you're a part of their activities. So, I mean, she was the army girl and she had all the equipment. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that I asked her, what are your memories, you know? And she said, well, Mom, really, it was in the backyard with the boys playing. <laughs> and it wasn't until Jeff started school, um, him being two years older, a little bit old, over that, actually, um, that it was really our time to be together. Of course, we did a lot of shopping together. Um, I had a little more time to make her some beautiful 
you know, clothes and to make her feel special and valued. And, um, and I brought her into some of my crafting and mm -hmm. activities that really kind of refreshed and encouraged me. And then I also, it was a time where, where I could develop, you know, have her friends over and have a friend over at, at three, let's play. And for her to get to know um, some other girls. And it's really neat for me to think how um, three of the families that she was close to all through grade school and high school were all girl families. Mm. Three girls in one family. She needed that she girl time. She just needed that girl time. And um, that was very positive. But sometimes I would ask her, well, how did, you know, what did you do? And how fun was it? And she'd go drama. You know, <laughs> it was, a, it was different. It was different than her three brothers, but uh, that was okay. Um, what helped you bring joy to your home in regards to your attitude, perspective, and outlook as a young mother? Okay. Um, I remember a season, and it was right after we um, moved. Um, we moved 20 miles to a new community, and uh, my third son was born two weeks after we moved there. So um, it was a new community to me. I didn't have a lot of support there. I was, uh, I was 30 miles and 20 miles from many um, grandparents. And um, so it was, it was a lonely time for me. And um, I remember thinking, I feel like the world is passing me by. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, I was on the floor a lot just with the boys. And um, I was just so needing to be really home base was it because of um, Jeff, you know, being an infant. And um, I just kind of felt out of touch. Um, you know, I was a nurse as a profession. And so I just thought how, you know, I really enjoyed that. But um, I knew that for me, I, I'm just not good at multitasking and especially a job to, to be a mother and have these children would have been really challenging for me. But God um, was there and he basically impressed upon me, Deborah, abide in me. Stop and think about it. This is really what you wanted. You wanted to be a mom. You just are enjoying your kids. It's a lot of work. It's intense. It's, you know, meals and just keeping up with the basics. I liked when you said it was simple. The kids were happy. Yes. Just noticing that you were achieving the goal. Yes. Just in the yes. I, I was achieving it. But, you know, the world wants to pull you. This, you don't have enough. Mm. Um, you know, that husband, you're asking him to help with different things. And I, I know I was communicating, you're not enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I need more. I need more of this or that. And um, the Lord was saying to me, Deborah, but are you communicating your need to me? Mm. Look to me to bring, you know, whatever that need is. And I can remember thinking, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I was thinking, I need a time of refreshment. This is intense. I just need a bit of a break. And then I needed to wait. And before long, I found myself, you know, I don't know how many weeks later, but I'm at the beach with <laughs> our family. And I'm thinking, this, this is what I prayed for. The kids are digging to China. And I can sit here and read my book, you know. That's so nice. And he, he would give me that. Yes. Um, but we're daughters of Eve, and I think, isn't that what the enemy said to her? Mm. You, you don't have enough. You're missing out on something. And be sure that you're just going, mm. wait a minute. No, God, God is all I need. I need to communicate, and you know, maybe it's to my husband, mm -hmm. but I, just being present and being in a, in a place of just um, contentment yeah. and where he is where you are, I think is a really important thing to, to have in mind. Yes. And I've confessed that those similar things to you of like, oh, husband, I want this. And then he gets us this. And I'm like, oh, and then I want this. And it's just like, oh, it's just a lot. Yes. I, I recognize that. Um, any specific ideas God has given you to bring joy to the home? You know, I ask my children that are now in their late 30s and 40s, like, what do you remember? And they actually said, um, eating meals together. Mm. 
Um, we did eat in the dining room sometimes, but we had this little peninsula, and I don't know how we managed to eat around this little peninsula, and there were six of us. <laughs> but we were just shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> that was precious to them. They said they just really enjoyed that. Road trips, um, just, you know, together. Um, reading the Bible together was one that, uh, one of my sons re said really stood out to him. And we didn't do it on a regular basis. I'm sorry to say that. But when we did, um, he said it really um, modeled mm -hmm. to him that that was important to us. Of course, we talked about it. Another thing um, that one of my sons mentioned was um, discipline. Not an easy thing. But discipline is very is a very loving act. It looks different for each child, and there's different ways. But discipline teaches the process of sin, of forgiveness, and restoration. And um, they're all key elements to salvation. And our children need to understand that. Time needs to be taken to, to, to share with them, no, you did wrong. Now, um, one of our children was a very challenging person to discipline. The other three, I, I don't know why, but it seemed a little easier. But one of them, to get his heart, was really difficult. And um, he would um, pick on his brothers and sister. He would do different things. And then when it got to grade school, it was there as well. And a teacher just came to us and said, I don't know what to do. And um, we said, we don't either. And um, <laughs> so we went and got some professional help for my husband and I and for our child. And we needed some tools. Our child needed some tools. And we did that. And um, then it was really cool as well to see God bring in some other things into that child's life that really changed his heart. But one of our sons reminded me that was, he was actually just kind of sucking the joy out of our family mm -hmm. because of his behavior. And we needed to stop it and we needed to deal with it. And um, so um, th that's really important that you focus in on, on the discipline. Okay, Deborah, and this is our last question so we can have some Q&A time. These are all great. You see why I wanted her to share. Um, but can you describe how you stay bonded to your adult children now? Okay. Well, you know, as they grow, you do, you do different um, activities with them. And um, I just want to encourage, I know many of you in this room, you're so gifted. You've got photography, you're mm -hmm. bakers, you're, and you use it to serve the Lord and that type of thing. And Take those activities and share it with your children. Bond with your children in that. One of the things that um, I enjoyed that was refreshing to me was going to, the, I like classical ballet, going to the symphony, different activities. And so I would purposely, with my sons, take them once or twice a year. It would be mother, daughter. It was our kind of our special date night. Maybe we would go to dinner beforehand, or maybe we would just get ice cream afterwards. But um, not too long ago, it was right before Christmas, and I got a call from my six-year-old granddaughter, Elise, and she said, Grammy, guess what I got to do tonight? And I said, well, what? I did, she lives in Ellensburg, Washington, and I didn't know. And she said, I went to the ballet with my daddy. Mm -hmm. And she told me about the ballet. Mm -hmm. And um, that was so exciting. And then my son got on the phone, and it was kind of a different take, you know, of it wasn't the standard ballet, but he had gone. Um, I took each of my boys when they were 10 to the Nutcracker. And that was the ballet. And so, and then Jeff, you know, he shared with me all about that. And, you know, I hung up the phone and it was like, thank mm. you, Lord. What a wonderful gift that mm. what I've done for my mm. children is now being carried on, mm -hmm. you know, for them. And they're bonding with yeah. their daughters and their sons. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, there's a principle. It's in scripture. And that principle is you reap what you sow 
later than you sow and more than you sow. So there's a promise there. Mm. You're spending time with your kids and investing in them. You're going to reap that. Mm. Um, you're, in so many ways, I experience, I want my children to want to be with me and mm -hmm. to share their lives. I want to be a part of my grandchildren's lives. And to get a phone call on one of my granddaughters is just a horse whisper. And she wants me to watch her riding her horse and sharing that. She lives in North Carolina. But you don't know how that thrills mm. my heart that my son knows that that's important. And he wants me to be a part of that. Yeah, Thank that's you. awesome. Thank you so much, Deborah. Can we just give her a hand? <laughs> Okay, so we have your Q&A questions. We will not have time to answer all of them, but we will stick around. We made some room in our schedule, so we would love to um, answer that. And sometimes if it's just really specific, it's just nice to get a few more details. So that's maybe why we didn't choose to answer it. But our first question says, any re recommendations for finding a Christian therapist? And so like I was saying earlier, sometimes you need a friend, a mentor, sometimes you need a, a therapist. Ideally, a therapist is giving you tools for a season to help equip you and your family with your need. Jen Hibbs is working on a list, so you could talk to her and tell her maybe what's going on and she could give you that list of some recommended people. And then um, there's also a website called Psychology Today where you can type in if you want a Christian counselor, what your insurance is, and um, it'll populate some ideas for you. And then our second question is ideas for fun things for kids to do riding in the car instead of screen time. Things that don't involve things that can fall out of kids' reach. That's important. Okay, thanks. Um, so my, my first thoughts were uh, to play games. I don't know how old the kids are, but like I spy with my little eye something green and then everyone guesses or we're going on a trip and we're gonna, I'm gonna pack an apple. And then she would say, I'm going on a trip, I'm gonna pack an apple and a banana. And it's just like a memory game that's kind of fun. But did you have some... The audio? Yes, we did some long uh, road trips to um, I have family in Wyoming and Canada. So, um, you know, Adventures in Odyssey and just um, those stories. Things that I would enjoy listening to, you know. And uh, kids' tape and music is great for a while. But, okay, <laughs> I want some of my kind of music, mm -hmm. too. So, um, you know, so finding things that, you know, I just really liked the earlier, I haven't heard much of the later adventures in Odyssey, mm. but the earlier ones were really great and, and good for the younger age group. Oh, that's perfect. I love that audiobook idea. Okay, I have an 11 year old daughter. Do you have any beginning type devotional books that you'd recommend for a mommy daughter to do together? So the first thing that came to mind was Donna Gresh has this book, Lies Young Women Believe. That might be too old for her, but I think that's a great book. It's based off of the Lies Women Believe book. And then um, she also did this thing called Secret Keeper Girls. That might be good for the youngers. And I also want to do a small plug for, I used to work at Living Wholehearted and T Tara Matson is a trauma-informed therapist who's a Christian. She has this group called Courageous Girls and you can get this free curriculum and the idea is that you do it with other moms. So you could, your daughter learns from others and it, you create this closed group and they journey through uh, elementary, middle school, and high school. I can't wait till my daughter's old enough to try to do something like that. And then you had a good point, Deborah, about... De yes, I... I like devotionals where there were um, discussion questions, and then also just going through a book of the Bible, uh, letting, you know, don't forget the power of God's Word, and what He can just, how He can speak into your child, and it's a real encouragement to hear their responses and how the Spirit is just speaking to them, and, you know, maybe it's just, um, let's read Philippians, and then let's just read a chapter you know, a couple times a week, you just, you know, read through that for the summer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, that really encouraged my heart. That's really good. And then brothers six and eight are constantly fighting. Any ideas how to train against this? Boys also need freedom. And um, so I would say, you know, I had my kitchen window was big and it was to the backyard and I'd open the window but letting the boys go out there and just play they can play separately they can play together getting them outside 
and uh, just giving them any way you can, going to the park, maybe setting up some boundaries, but giving them freedom to explore or play or just do um, some activities, I think is just, there's something about that that they need. Um, and then bringing them alongside you, I think is really important. I, I'm a canner and yes, a berry picker. <laughs> and my boy, you know, when my children could walk, they were picking berries, they were picking raspberries. <laughs> Cherries out of the tree, they love that. And um, blueberries. And, <laughs> you know, they liked eating those pies. And I <laughs> made sure that what they picked, they got to have a big portion of. And um, bring them along in your activities. Make them feel a very important part of, of the family unit. And, and then encourage them with... Um, I love a lot of what Ben Burns said about just encouraging that positive. Thank you for helping your brother with that mm -hmm. and that. Um, it, yeah, that relationship and, and just stages of not getting along it, are challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think rivalry is really common just in any sibling relationship. So really speaking like, wow, your brother's really good at this and you're really good at that. And just celebrating the differences, but not highlighting one brother. Why can't you be more like John? You know, that's just going to create that tension so that they know that there's love for both of them. This one says, I usually leave the house with kids every day to go do something fun. Being at home at the house, I feel the stress of needing to take care of housework and duties rather than simply playing with my kids. How can I better balance this so I can have joy and peace more at home with my kids? So the first thing that came to my mind, I'm not an ultimate like minimalist. I still want to keep things that I might use later, but um, something that's really helped us is getting rid of how much stuff we do have by doing like that toy rotation thing. So um, I always let them have their stuffed animals and they have a special shelf with their special things, but um, being able to not have mega, mega tiles and Legos big and small all together is just, it's not as fun. And um, kids tend to also get stressed out with a lot of activities. So sometimes if we can pull out one thing at a time or a couple different things, but that's really brought more joy into our home to feel like I could kind of tidy up in 25 minutes and um, just have a little more peace in the home with that. So that's something that's helped. But also if you need to go to the park to just get away, that's, that's great, that's okay. But any more ideas with she wants to be in the home? Right, it, it's, I think it's more work at first, but helping your children feel that um, they need to be helpers. The, how can they become a part of folding the laundry? It may not look like the way you want it folded, but helping with those chores really is an important concept with family. They're a part of a family, and this is what you do. And it's, it's, yeah, it's work to make that happen, but it's worth it. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Okay, we have a, we'll take maybe two more here. Um, how can you bond with a two-year-old that isn't very verbal yet, but is very strong-willed? Um, a quick idea for this is if you want to create a song for your kid um, that can feel intimidating if you're not musically minded, but I would just suggest take a song that's already out there and you just um, put in their name. So, so-and-so is my son, so-and-so is my daughter. And then just ask the Lord to give you some lyrics, but that is a tradition that you can do of just instilling, instilling that bond that this is your guys' song. And if they're not verbal yet, we know they're still watching your facial expressions for approval. Like, was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? How does this work? Does anything come to mind for you? I just think, just keep playing with them, the verbal God willing, will come. You know, it takes time. Kids are on different tracks with that. Yes, my second wasn't very verbal, but he didn't need to be because the first one did all the talking for him. Mm. <laughs> so I don't know if that's the situation, but that can happen. And then, Deborah, can you mention that Paul Tripp discipline? We're getting some questions just on, like, disciplining and hard situations. Um. Did I did I mention oh, that? Yes, um, that was just privately. You mentioned that, but did you find a? Does that coming to mind a resource about specifically discipline? Oh yes, and sorry um, to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, this um, is the fun of Q and A, yes, live Q and A. Um, <laughs> Paul Tripp 
is a great resource, and I actually pulled him up on YouTube, mm. and um, Paul Tripp, uh, Parenting with Grace and Discipline, and he made a statement, um, my job is to build into a child a sense of need. Now, I think the physical things that you do, I mean, we want our children to be confident, to be leaders, to be, you know, able to, you know, be strong. But then in the spiritual, it's, it's kind of the opposite. Mm. We want them to f see a need for the Lord and go to him and share with him. So that, that's a big challenge. But parenting, how you give grace in a situation, but address the conflict, mm. address the problem. Um, children are born into a system of authority. You're the parent. It's okay for you to say, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a boundary. That's okay. Using your healthy parent power. We call yes. that in the counseling yes. world. But parenting is to be a tool for a heart change. Mm -hmm. Left to themselves, where is their heart <laughs> going to go? You know, to their selfish, their needs, their flesh, and that type of thing. So you're there to guide that heart change and bring them to Christ. Mm -hmm. So the last question we'll wrap up with is around just screen time, kind of, and I know how this goes, because like I was sharing, my kids were screaming and yelling um, about the screen time, and um, so kind of sounding like parents afraid to take that away, and what could some of the steps be for that? So I just thought of my own example. Um, sometimes you can go cold turkey, you know, and if it's, if it's just a show that maybe season one was great, but as you got further into this season, it's just like, whoa, this is just heavy stuff. This is not what we signed up for. It's good to just cut that off. Now, if it's more just kind of like, oh, this just probably isn't the best, you might use a weaning process where you just kind of slowly start to limit that time, set those external timers. Um, but don't be afraid. If your kid expect that they're going to cry, they're going to scream, they're going to yell, that is parenting, is riding out that wave of big emotion with them and showing them that you love them even though they're responding that way and you're going to stay as best you can with the Lord's help calm. They do not have the power and the control. They need to know that safety relies not in their hands, but you're helping to create an environment that's safe for them and then provide real things, good things that do engage them. And you were saying stuff about that, Deborah. Yes, I think summer is a perfect time if you want to work on that um, because there are so many neat things that you can do, yeah. um, you know, going to the zoo. I mean, I'm thinking of zero to five, but, you know, mm -hmm. just having some fun activities Asking them, what, what do you want to do? Engage with them. Mm. You know, they have ideas. They've got good ideas. And just to, to say that, I like that idea. And yeah. let's do that. And, you know, they really, um, they're, they're in your home. They're listening to you. You guys are all, you're working so hard. And I, you're here. <laughs> and um, so I know that. So your children have got great ideas. And get write some of those ideas down and, and then do some of those with them. I liked what you were saying, too, about we can talk to our kids and say, hey, we want to grow your brain tree. And this just isn't quite growing it. Or, wow, you're so good at the piano. Like, we want to make time for that. So I liked how you were encouraging, engage with them. We can kind of tell them what we're trying to do with ourselves and for them and see if they can catch that, that dream too with us. Yes. Okay, yes. we're almost at time, but a final thought to wrap us up. Um, I think I already mentioned my final thought. Yes. I was going to do the, the um, you know, you reap what you sow later than you sow mm. and more than you sow. And, yeah. you know, it, that is just uh, something that I've tried to keep in mind and um, um, just thinking about the future for my children and, uh, and, and then they're going to be parents mm. and they will model, um, you know, that I think that's a promise. They, you know, it can be negative as well. Hey, we're, we, we do, I sure didn't do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, can't go back now. But um, so many things, serving the Lord, that is a beautiful thing that comes out of good parenting and modeling. Um, our, our children just naturally want to serve the Lord. It, 
Craig and I, you know, consistency in church, wanting to serve. Um, We're teaching that next generation how to show up to church, how to get ready in the morning, how yes. to not make it all about them. Yes, yes. yes. And we see that in Shanna, who runs around and serves, and her husband, yeah, her too. Yeah, her husband, Dan. And, and um, so that's very fulfilling and rewarding for us, and your, your children will do that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much, Deborah. I appreciate that. Okay, we'll hand it over to the mom-to-mom -mom team. <laughs> thank you. 